Hi everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. That's it. Yeah, I'm Hannah. I work at, for the Sunday Times, and together with my colleague David Collins, we worked on this investigation over a few months last year. I thought the best way to do it would just literally to talk you through sort of how we set about doing it and sort of walk you through all the steps and, and the challenges and things that we encountered. I will take questions, but maybe save them for the end because I might answer them as we go along. Um, so, I mean, I'd start by saying that with a lot of, um, as with a lot of stories, this, if you look at the date on this, this story was actually around for sort of nearly 10 years and it was just there in plain sight. Um, and what we found, you know, it was, I think it was Sky who broke it um, and it was followed up by, you know, nearly all of the nationals. Um, but no one had really sort of decided to dig into it um, until, until we did. Um, and what we found was actually once you found the right people, they just hadn't been asked the right questions before, but actually it wasn't that difficult. And it was kind of astounding that the police and the army hadn't asked the questions that we were doing because we didn't find it all that difficult um, to basically solve a murder that had happened 10 years ago in another country. Um, so, you know, they'd, they, it, what we found was that his name had basically been known since 2012. It was an open secret within the regiment and, you know, it was something that was laughed about, that was joked about, um, but, you know, no one had really done anything about that. Um, so, my colleague David, um, he'd had, he'd been leaked some documents in 2016, which included a list of some names of soldiers who were there on the night. Uh, so, some of them were full names, some of them were sort of partial names with just initials. Um, but, the in those documents, there are basically some things in there which caused him and others on the investigations team to doubt whether the story was true, whether British soldiers were involved, and that was the reason why our team didn't look at it sooner. So that was basically, there was a detail in those documents that said um, basically that her organs, like her womb, had been cut out after the murder. And be, you know, and because of that, they, there was a sort of doubt as to whether British soldiers would know how to do that, would be involved in doing that, and that's why our investigations team sort of passed it over. And then, you know, several years later, David said to me, "Do you want to have a look at this one?" And that detail turned out not to be true. So he later went out to Kenya, and I'll talk about that a bit later. And he got some new documents, and um, yeah. That, that detail that had thrown people off originally, uh, I think it was in some witness statements or something, but we later got sort of pathologist reports and things like that, and, and that, that hadn't happened. So I guess that was a learning thing for us as well. If you're not sure about it, then it's probably worth doing it rather than not doing it. Um, it is one thing that we took away from that. So um, we sort of decided, I think it was the end of the summer and we, you know, we had some, our work tends to, you know, it goes in peaks and troughs and we had a bit of a quiet period. So we're like, yeah, we'll, we'll have a look at this. And we, um, we sent a freelancer in Kenya to uh, speak to the family initially. Um, so I will just go back. I'll sort of talk you through. So the first story we did, um, we sent a freelancer in Kenya to talk to the family and to find out a bit about what had happened there. And we started, um, between us, we divided up the list of names and we, um, we tried to find those people. So we sort of had to guess at their rough ages and we had to um, take a guess at where where they were likely to be located. So it's, um, it was the Duke of Lancaster's regiment. So that covers sort of Merseyside, Greater Manchester, Lancashire, and it's an infantry regiment. So it's not one that would sort of pull in sort of officers from all over. So we guess they would be local to the Northwest. And so uh, we just set about with these list of names and um, 
yeah, so this, this was the first one we did. And so, yeah, we had a freelancer in Kenya who managed to um, collect some information for us, speak to family, speak to witnesses. And then we, so we set about with these names. And initially, what we found with this is there was very little convincing people to talk to you. It went one way or another. It was either you send them a message and you're immediately blocked. You knock on the door and they say, I can't help you. Or it was, I've known about this for 10 years and actually I've thought it was wrong that whole time and I'll help you as much as I can. And there was really nothing in between. Um, and we, we got, I think there were seven names on the list that David had and he took four and I took three or the other way around. And um, I didn't get to any of them. He got to one and he basically, he denied having been at the hotel that night. We knew he was because we had copies of their passports. Um, and so he just, he didn't help. And then basically I'd, um, the last one that I'd been to, I'd pushed a note through the door, um, just saying, as we did with all of them, just saying that I wanted to speak to him about, I think I said about Kenya. Um, I pushed that through his door and, you know, didn't think that much of it. And then later um, that evening, I was actually at Andy Burnham's summer drinks and got a phone call and it off a number that I didn't recognise. And it, it, it was... Um, what had happened is he no longer lived there, but somewhat he was still in touch with people that did, and they'd passed a message on, and he'd called me. And basically, he agreed to meet me in a couple of days' time. So he wanted to meet me at his workplace. So um, we, I, I did that. Um, and so I went to meet him, and we talked for about an hour and a half. How many of you have shorthand? Okay, cause, great, because he asked me not to record it. So I had to do shorthand for an hour and a half. Um, so I think I pulled out my dictaphone and he said, please don't record it. So um, uh, I, my hand was hurt by the end of it. But he, so he had been there on the night and he um, was one of those that was kind of, he didn't know... Um, he didn't know who the perpetrator was, but he was aware of, you know, it was someone within the regiment. Um, and he was sort of just incredibly frank. And every question that I asked, he gave me an honest answer about having sex with prostitutes, how much he paid them, how many, you know, what sort of protection they used and all of this. And he just answered all of them incredibly candidly. Um, and, you know, I said to him, you know, why, why are you doing this? And he, he, he basically just said that... Um, he was no longer in the army and he he was quite ashamed of some of the stuff that he'd done and that, that he'd participated in and he he wanted to help so he gave he gave me all of that and then he i showed him the list of names and he filled in the blanks and he also really helpfully um didn't just complete the names but he like sent me links to their facebook profiles as well so that i could message them so he he was great so he was sort of our first breakthrough and so off the back of that and with the stuff from kenya um we did this one and that has um yeah these are these are his quotes here um and he, yeah he told us stuff about um like the, 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 Emir, the army knew because he said they tested them all for STIs when they came back from Kenya and things like that. So, um, so yeah, he was really good. And so then it was just a case of, so we started with these seven names and I think only three or four of them were full names. And we built that up to somewhere between 65 and 70, just from every person that, um, that we spoke to, um, I just asked them, and who else should I speak to and who else might know and who else was there. And so then we built up this whole list of names um, and just approached them all. <laughs> and as I say, some of it was like, very, you know, I messaged them on Facebook. And I'd say Facebook was so useful for this. And it depends on the type of story and the type of people that you're trying to contact. But we were helped by the fact that they all had... Um, they, most of them used their real names on Facebook and they nearly all had open friends lists as well. Uh, so their profiles weren't that private. So 
we were quite lucky in that sense because that's not always the case. Um, I have a separate work Facebook account, which is in my real name. Um, I just accept anyone that adds me as a friend and, you know, I add people as friends. And um, so that, that was really useful. And um, what was actually useful, um, so some of them screenshotted my messages and shared them on their own profiles or like in groups, sort of, they had like a closed groups for the regiment and things. Um, and they're like, oh, you know, this journalist been contacting me. But it was actually really useful for me because it gave them more confidence because they realised that I was approaching lots of people because then people would comment underneath and say, oh, she's contacted me as well, or I've had the same message. Um, and at first I was a bit like, oh, because, um, you know, you don't really want a private message to be posted in a public forum. But I guess, you know, you should always assume that it may be um, at some point. But yeah, that was actually really useful because the ones who did speak to me, I think they felt a bit protected by that, by the fact that they knew that I'd messaged dozens of people. Um, and then we got through, um, I got my second really good source. Um, and so his motivations were similar and also um, that he didn't want himself to be in the frame for this. So, you know, he he was, I think, you know, the fact that she had a daughter, the daughter's now 10, a lot of these men had kids of a similar age. So um, that, you know, that was that was one thing that he mentioned, but also he was just like, I had nothing to do with this. And I don't, you know, I don't want this being dragged up and all this. So that was, um, that was, um, you know, among his motivations. And then um, he was just really helpful in the same way and um, just sort of, um, why don't you speak to this person? Why don't you speak to this one? And he also made some sort of, I think because people were talking about it, because they'd seen me get in touch, they also started talking about it among themselves. So then he was able to make some sort of discreet inquiries and pass me information that way. So that was really helpful. Um, and then he put me in touch, um, or basically suggested that I approach... Um, a th and yeah, that guy. So the, the thing with him, though, was he was still very nervous about it all. And so I'd messaged him on Facebook and he said, sorry, I can't help you. And he blocked me. And then I'd say like a day later, I got a phone call from a withheld number. And that time I was actually at a Tory party conference and I had to go outside and take a call. And he thought about it and he, um, you know, decided he did want help. But I still don't have contact details for him. So he blocked me on Facebook. I never had his phone number. But, you know, we got to the stage where he was ringing me maybe every other day and sometimes he'd ring early in the morning sometimes he'd ring late at night he'd ring at the weekend and I'd just have to pick up my phone because I knew it would be because he'd got some information and it would always be a blocked number and we did um you know we had quite a friendly relationship because this went on over several weeks so like once he rang me at half six he's like you're asleep weren't you and um you know so but yeah it was I think the thing that I'd say as well that was useful was as a, another learning point for me was that not everyone is comfortable with the same method of communication and you don't know which one it's going to be um so some people don't want to put things in writing but they'll pick up the phone some people will happily message you on facebook or whatsapp but they won't um uh, but you know they won't talk to you or they won't meet you and some people want to know you're not recording it and they want to meet you in person so um, again, that was something I, when I messaged him on Facebook, I said, this is my number, you can call me, you can WhatsApp me, or I'm happy to meet in person. And, you know, that, it, it, it was quite different, um, quite, yeah, people, people took advantage of those different options, which is good. And then, yeah, so through that guy, I approached another guy, and um, this time I was driving down the motorway, and he phoned, and he said... Um, and he said, do you want to know the name? And I just said, yes, please. And he said, it was 
this guy and he said and this guy helped him so I was like trying to pull over trying to get my dick's phone out um, on the M60 in Manchester and so at this point David was in Kenya so David had flown out to Kenya um, which I was really miserable about at the time because there was talk that I would go to Kenya and then it was um, that then I, you know, the decision was made that David that goes to Kenya and I'd stay here, but actually, you know, the, the desk called that right because um, it, it worked well. I managed to um, build up those relationships with, you know, and, and do that work in the UK. So it was fine. But he was in Kenya, and I think so while he was there, it was while, you know, while the sort of people who held most of the information were in the UK, um, it, it was really important, I thought, for us to be in Kenya as well, because one thing, it allowed us to send to Agnes and send her family in this story. Um, I think that was really important as responsible journalists that we did that, and they've been with us from the start. We're still in touch with them now. Um, and um, yeah, so that that was you know one key part. They sort of took us. They took David to where her body was, and they shared photographs with us and all of that. So I think that was really important. And also, David spoke to her friends who'd been there that night with her. So it really allowed us to build it up from like both sides. And um, he also got hold of inquest documents while he was in Kenya. So there was a 2019 inquest. And they had some really good details and also helped us to establish the facts. And there were some really strong quotes. Um, they, they, don't have, um, they don't have coroners doing inquests in Kenya, it's magistrates. And the magistrate, the judge, um, she read out a poem in the inquest and it was incredibly powerful. And we used that in the, in the story. So. Um, it, you know, it was really good that we were able to do that and that, you know, that, that I'm grateful that the paper backed it from the start and, you know, they gave us the space and they gave us the resources um, to go to do that. Um, so, yeah, I ran David, who was in Kenya, and I said, I, I think I know who's done it. But we were like, we didn't quite believe it or, we're, you know, we weren't, we weren't sure. Um, and then it was a case of... We needed to get that name again and again and again um, before you know we could even think about approaching him. So then it was just more of the same. Who should I speak to? Going through people's Facebook friends, looking for people who, a lot of them it was quite obvious. They were like in groups, sort of the Duke of Lancaster Facebook group on Facebook, or they had pictures of themselves in military uniforms. So you could work out who might have been there and just asking for the name. And then we got it four times and. Um, we also got, there was one guy I approached, he said, no, I don't know anything, but then someone else sent me a screenshot of a WhatsApp chat where he was in and he'd said the name in that. So um, so we, we had it, I think it was four times and then the fifth time with the WhatsApp messages. So then we, we reached a point where, um, you know, we were happy, our editors were happy and our lawyers were happy um, that we could sort of think about approaching um, them. So what we were, what we believed when we set out was that um, two people had been involved, that there was sort of a main perpetrator and a helper. And this was kind of the, um, this was kind of the rumor that had gone around. And there were, there were, there were all sorts of, so the rumor was uh, within the army that he had, um, strangled her during a sex game gone wrong so that was what people in his regiment believed um, and then when we did that first story we reported that um, she'd been stabbed and so I think they you know they that was another thing that prompted some of them to talk because it, what had happened was different to what they believed had happened but basically it it, it took a while to get to the, which is always the case when it's sort of 10 year old dreams. Oh, this was one we did in between, which was just about the culture there. It's some really grim stuff. So basically they had to rebuild the fence around um, the British Army Training Centre because soldiers were like putting their penises through the holes in the fence um, to use sex workers. Um, and 
um, you know, so it just proved that, the, you know, if the army had done that, they knew that this was happening, basically. So this was a piece we did in between about the culture. And after we did the first one, again, we had some soldiers, current and ex-soldiers from different regiments coming forward and saying, you know, everything that guy said is right. This is what I saw. This is what I did. So that, that was the one we did in between. And then this one. So... This was the interview. This, this is like the key interview that um, basically sealed it for us. So this was the guy that we had been told had helped um, to um, kill her. And what happened was, um, so I was sort of, we, you know, we got the sign off. We said we we're going to go knock it. So I was outside his house with a photographer from about seven in the morning, but he didn't come out, it got to about lunchtime, we thought, oh, we'll just knock it. Um, he didn't live there anymore. And the person who did live there knew him, told me the vague area that he'd moved to, but um, wouldn't give me more details than that. So we had another previous address for him, which was about an hour away. So I drove there and that house was boarded up. So it really felt like sort of the the end of the line but we're like and at this point we thought he was a suspect and actually you know at the point we were meeting with each of these at the time we thought they could have been the perpetrator so we had to think about you know how you handle that but um and then basically we we're like well we, we need to you know at least get a message to him and and give him the opportunity to respond and so um managed to find a relative of his um who um who lived in the town where this guy had said he'd moved to so um i was like right well we'll go there and see if they can pass on a message so i sort of sat there's no one in knocked it there's no one in so I sat in my car for a bit outside and um basically um he he does a job where he wears clothing like a uniform basically distinctive clothing um and i was just sat in my car and i saw someone wearing wearing that type of clothing walking past the front of my car i was like oh my god it's him um, and i realized that he was he was there and he went like you could see him in the window sort of getting changed out of his work clothes and i rang david and i was like i think he's in there and he's like well you better go and knock it then um and so then I knocked on the door and he came down in just his underpants. And so we conducted this whole interview with him stood in the doorway in just some grey boxer shorts. Um, but it was actually like, it was quite useful in a way because I'm really face blind. I really struggle to like recognise faces, like those place the face pub quizzes. I get like zero out of 10, but I, he had tattoos and I'd seen pictures of him in Kenya and I recognised his tattoos, so it was actually quite useful, if a bit distracting. Um, and at first he wouldn't talk, he was like, no, I don't want to talk about that, I don't want to talk about that. Um, and I said something to him along the lines of, which is what we believed at the time, we, we said, you know, well, you know, we know it wasn't really you, you just helped, you know, and he was like, no, I, and that, that, was, that was kind of what spurred him to talk because he's like, I didn't have anything to do with it. It's ruined my life. Um, and then he just came out with it all. And he said, you know, I tried to tell everyone at the time. And he said that what had happened was this guy had come in crying, saying, I've killed her, I've killed her. And he said he and several others, and he gave me their names, but none of them would talk. Um, he basically like, took them out the back, lifted the lid of this septic tank and showed them the body. Um, and he said he'd gone back to the base and he said they'd been picked up that night. He'd gone back to the base, he tried to report it and everyone had told him to basically sort of shut up and go away. And um, he's sort of, as a result of that, he was sort of bullied, he was laughed at, his mental health deteriorated. Um, he, he said he'd had some sort of substance issues and it was all because of this and the fact that he wasn't believed. Um, and so, you know, I said to him, you know, I said sort of, we, we think we know who it is, but, you know, just for the avoidance of doubt, can you tell me the name of the person you're talking about? And he sort of gave me the full name, including the middle name. So I was just like, okay, yeah, definitely the right person. And then... Um, 
I remember, so I, I had my recorder in my pocket that time. <laughs> I'd sort of learnt my lesson about not getting it out. So I had it in my pocket and I was just thinking, I, the whole time I was like, I really hope this is recorded. <laughs> and anyway, it had. Um, so it was fine and I sort of, I rang David afterwards and he said, don't tell me he's confessed. And I was like, well, not exactly, but sort of. And he was like, I said, I'll email you, I'll send you the recording. And um, that, that was sort of when we realised that, you know, we, we were getting pretty close. Um, and we'd filled in most of the blanks about what had happened. And um, so I was meant to be going to see a, a football match that night. And so I was sort of driving home. So to David said, do you think I should still go to the United match tonight? And he was like, I don't think so. <laughs> um, so um, basically then I'd got home and David had listened to it by that point. They said, email it to Ben and Emma, who are our editor and deputy editor, and they listened to it. And they were like, be outside his house at 6 a.m. And it was about a four hour drive away. So we had to like set off that night. Um, they booked us into a budget hotel as usual. And we sort of had to drive through the night. It was pouring with rain. And be outside this guy's house at 6 a.m. the next morning. And we had a photographer with us from a local agency who is brilliant if you ever need a photographer. Um, He's called Jordan, and I think he works for Southwest News, but he never took his eye off that door. So the thing we wanted was to get the picture of him first. Um, so we wanted to get the photograph of him, and then we'd approach him. So we were just sat in this car, and yeah, um, Jordan just never took his eyes off the door. So we'd be having a conversation, but he wouldn't be looking at you, he'd be looking at the door. And at one point, he was like, you need to get out of my car now because I need a wee. And he just like weed into a bottle and then we could get back in. But he was great. Um, and uh, yeah, so we waited from about six in the morning until like, it was dark when we got there until about six in the evening. And um, we'd expected he'd come out. And what we realised afterwards, there was a back door. So he probably had gone out, but it wasn't immediately obvious from the road. And I think his cars were parked at the back. Um, so we, we ran the desk and we just said, um, yeah, we, we thought he might be sort of taking his kid to school. And then we locked up. So we were like really ready to go at like half eight, thinking he's going to come out any minute. And um, he didn't appear. and. So we went on the, he and his partner shared quite a lot of, they, they have very open profiles, so we knew which school these kids went to and everything. So we went on the school's website, because um, they put pictures of them up in uniform, and uh, it was half term that day, so half term had started that day, so like, oh, we don't know when they're going to come out now. Um, so it got to like six o'clock and we just knocked it, and then um, what happened was, he answered the door with his child there, so that just made it really, really difficult. Um, because, you know, I said, he, we, we knew, we thought he would be expecting a knock from us because all of this had been playing out for several weeks on the Facebook profiles of people he was friends with. And so we thought that he, you know, when people were saying, no, she's been to my house or, you know, I've had a message. So we thought he was probably expecting us. So, you know, it wasn't that he hadn't thought about it for 10 years. Um, so Dave and I just did that one together, uh, together. Well, he was in the car outside just because the safety thing, you know, we thought this guy had actually killed someone in the past. So uh, we did it together. And yeah, so basically he answered the door with his kid. And I said, you know, Hannah L. I'm from the Sunday Times. And I said, uh, you know, I've come to talk to you about what happened in Kenya. Is there somewhere we can go? Can we maybe sit in the car? And he's just like, no, I don't want to talk to you. And then... Um, his wife came out and or partner i'm not sure if they're married or not and she was quite um hostile and she she turned out you know she knew what had happened or a version of it and was you know sort of shouting out us to go away um so we had to leave and then we sort of ran the desk and they were like well you need to put the allegations to him um so then what we did is basically like and they said go back after bedtime so what we did was we went and sat in a mcdonald's and typed up a very long letter with all of the very very detailed allegations i think it ran to about three pages 
Um, and we went back to the hotel we'd been staying in and we said, can you please print this and then immediately delete it? And they did. And we got an envelope from them and we went back about nine o'clock and we said, you know, you need to read this. We said, we'll wait outside. And then, it, you know, if you want to talk to us, we'll be waiting outside. And basically then he did. He, so his wife took or partner took the letter. Um, and she said, we'll read it together and um, we'll let you know. And then basically um, he came. Yeah, so we'd, we'd spent the whole day, obviously, like we'd been 12 hours just in the car outside and we're like, what if we've got this wrong? Because at this point, the paper like talking about naming him as well and picturing him and we're like, it's our reputations, it's our careers, it's the reputation of the paper. Like, this is really, really huge. And what if we've got it wrong? Anyway, sort of, we, so he spoke to us for about 40 minutes, which was just bizarre. Um, and that was it, basically. And we sort of went back to the hotel and started writing it up and, you know, sort of filed a, a version about two or three in the morning. And I think that was sort of Friday morning. We published this at 6 p.m. on Saturday. And then, and sort of with each story that we did, a lot of the sort of sources that we're speaking to got, uh, they felt a lot more confident, I think, in seeing that they hadn't been identified, in seeing that they couldn't work out from the stories who had been speaking to me. And that sort of gave them confidence to come forward. Um, and also there was some of the things that he'd said really didn't help himself. Like he said, oh, I, I didn't get on with them. They're just lads from council estates. And that line was in the story and that really sort of got some of their backs up. And like, he thinks he's better than us actually, you know, he's the one that's, that's a bad person. And, and that gave us, uh, that gave them, you know, sort of more reason to come forward and then basically the morning after we published I got sent these screenshots by one of them um, which was so which is like him basically um, sort of laughing and joking about it um, and this this was on um, like sort of ghost emojis and, and this is this is him doing like an angel emoji. Uh, so, um, you know, this sort of everything he'd denied to us was sort of disproved by these and, um, and or, you know, lots of things he denied to us. So um, that, was, that was our story the next week and I had to sort of drive that down and put that to him again. And we had the letter prepared this time and a printout and he didn't talk to um, he didn't talk to me but he did take the printout um, so yeah so we did that and then um, and then sort of we've tried to keep it going we did a, a few stories afterwards so um, things like in Nanyuki basically the British taxpayer through aid funding is funding projects to get vulnerable women out of sex work in Nanyuki and then the same taxpayer money that is paying for those British soldiers they were undermining that by then paying the women for sex um, so we did a story on that and then we did um, we did some stuff just around uh, basically misogyny in the armed forces and how a lot of this, I mean, and Ben Wallace, uh, the defence secretary has um, said that, um, you know, it, it is a cultural problem and um, that that was something that we tried to dig into a bit deeper. And yeah, just um, again, I'll just sort of, uh, yeah, so we, we, we did a, the latest update was this week, which was, um, which is essentially, um, I mean, one of my colleagues um, knocked on his door again this week, and um, he's basically still just out there living his life. So that was our, that was our latest update. Um, so one of the things that we found really difficult is that. Um, 
there's been a lot of book passing between different agencies. So um, the MOD, uh, the Royal Military Police, they did the initial investigation, which, you know, got absolutely nowhere, did nothing. Um, and the Kenyan, they're saying, well, we don't have jurisdiction for this. It can only be the Kenyans. But things like um, we gave the MOD the name, we gave the name of the key witness, we gave the name of the perpetrator, they haven't passed that to the Kenyan authorities. Um, it's a lot of uh, sort of book passing, a lot of, well, they haven't requested it in this right way by filling in this correct form. So basically it's just um, completely stalled. Soldier Y, the key witness, he actually went the day that I knocked on his door, um, he went and made a report to civilian police and basically told what he told me to the civilian police. Um, and but you know we we tried to get an update from them on uh, where where that's got to we tried to get an update from um the force where the alleged perpetrator lives and they're all just saying you have to go through you know you have to go through basically they pass everything back to the mod and then the mod don't tell us anything so there's lots of different agencies involved the kenyan police don't talk to us they never have um you know, they don't respond to emails, they don't, we, we've never been able to get anything from them. Um, so that, that was one of the challenges. Um, so yeah, that, that's, I think that's basically where we're at with it. Um, they also FOIs, I've put in so many FOIs asking for things like correspondence and um, they, they've all been refused on either national security grounds or diplomatic relations grounds, um, some on cost grounds. So we've not got anywhere with FOI. That's been very difficult. Um, the family have uh, instructed Lee Day, a human rights law firm. They basically flew out there, signed them up. And we think that is um, basically the, what we think that what became imminent uh, Im imminently obvious was that they you know they managed to disappear this for 10 years and they were hoping to disappear it again but we you know the fact that there's a human rights law firm working on this you know it, it will be slow but um we'll, we'll we might see something and um and yeah so there has been a little bit of movement on it this week so basically we believe that the Kenyan police have started making. So what they can do is, um, it's called a mutual legal assistance request. So because they're in Kenya, even though Kenya has the jurisdiction, they can ask the RMP to do things on their behalf. So can you question this person or can you do this? And just this week, we believe some of that is starting to happen. So um, that's where we're at with it. Um, we believe that, that, that at least one request has gone in to the MOD or is imminently going in. So um, we don't know, you know, we don't know what that will result in um, and, and how far it will get, but we're pleased to see, see a little bit of movement on it. Um, that's it really. Um, I mean, that was, it's the kind of thing you discuss with the lawyers and the editors before you do it. But yeah, there's such a huge public interest in this that we thought it was, um, you know, it was justified and, you know, we didn't have any complaints. Um, I spoke to him afterwards and he was, I think he was a little um, taken aback by how big it had gone. I don't think he has, you know, because he tried to tell this story so many times and no one had listened. So when suddenly it was all over the news, not just nationally, but internationally, I think he, he was a little taken aback by that, but he didn't complain about any of the techniques or methods or anything. He asked us not to identify him and we didn't. I think it was just, um, it was just a case of um it seems like there's a lot of sort of 
gossip and rumours that go around and not a lot of it is true and there were only a handful of them there that night, they'd been drinking, those two were friendly and they'd basically come back and told half a story and that, you know, they, I think they'd said that he had helped him to move the body. That was, so it, not that he'd helped kill her, the allegation was that he'd helped him dispose of the body. So that was what I put to him. And he was like, I never, I didn't, it was already in the tank, her body was already in the tank. So it wasn't, I guess it wasn't that distorted. It wasn't that he'd helped her, you know, to murder her. It was, the allegation was that he'd moved the body and helped to cover it up, whereas that wasn't it. But yeah, a lot of it turned out not, you know, a lot of stuff turned out not to be true. A lot of rumours. Um, and yeah, it was just sort of getting to the truth of which bits were, really. So we're really lucky in that we get quite a lot of freedom. So we were just like, we sort of said, we're lucky. If you say, I'm going to look into this, they'll give you three or four days off diary to do it. And if it doesn't come off, it doesn't really matter. Um, and it was when, so it was after we got the first interview with the guy who I met at his workplace um, and all that stuff around the culture. And it was, and then after that, when we did the second piece about the culture and there were more people coming forward, that, you know, that sort of convinced them that there was a story there. So preliminary, so it's not that unusual to do some preliminary work and that just involves sort of door knocks in the northwest of England, so that was fine. And yeah, it was kind of, it was their suggestion. They said, one of you should go to Kenya. So yeah, they, they backed it sort of right from the start. But yeah, we, you know, I think if we hadn't have got that first guy, that might have been more difficult. So it's just like one thing after another. So, uh, basically, so this is something that we just had a training on this week because the law on this is evolving all the time. Um, but it's more recently, sort of since Leveson, since Cliff Rich had been tipped, um, the balance has been tipped away from journalists and people, uh, it's a lot harder to name people before they're charged with a crime. Um, so there was... Um, the Mail did a front page, I think it was Stephen Lawrence, and it says, we, we say these men are guilty if, if we're wrong, sue us. So we thought about taking that step. You know, they'd, the editors had listened to both tapes, the lawyers had listened to both tapes, and, you know, we, we thought about, you know, sort of doing that and naming him and saying, if we're wrong, sue us. Um, but it just felt quite risky and we did take into it so it was also the MOD said because at that point when we went to them you know we were we went to them as though we were naming him and they said it could prevent a fair trial it could prevent justice so we did even though we had to take some of what they were saying with a pinch of salt we did we did take that into account and we didn't want to do anything that would impede justice and then the issue that you get is um of course, when they are charged, you get a whole different set of um, contempt laws coming in. But we hope that because the trial will be in Kenya, they won't apply. So, you know, if it, if it does get to the point where someone is charged in relation to this, then, um, then we might, might be able to name, name them then. I think... And this isn't specific to the Times, this is everywhere that I've worked with. Um, you, you often have to, like, they'll assume that everything's fine unless you ask for it. And then, like, they don't say you should take someone with you a lot of the time. You, you're like, can I take a photographer? And, you know, you, you have to think about that for yourself, I guess, because they've got lots of reporters doing lots of things and we're expected to work quite independently. So you do just have to think about that for yourself, which is fine. Um, except in the case of the, the perpetrator guy, they were very clear about that. They're like, you both need to go and, you know, if one of you is knocking it, the other one needs to be like, 
able to reach that front door in seconds if anything happens. Um, I think in terms of mental health and things, I mean, when you're in something like this, a lot of it, you're just running on adrenaline um, and it sort of comes after. And I I'm not speaking for everyone, but for me, you just keep going and going and going and it all feels very, you know, you don't really think about the danger or what you're, you know, and it's only sort of afterwards, once you've published it, that you come to digest it and think about some of the things that you've um, read and written and heard and, you know, seen someone sort of had people crying on the phone and all of that. And so often you don't process it until afterwards. And I guess um, just, it, I, I felt quite overwhelmed as well. Um, and it was actually just by coincidence, I'd gone to see a school friend who um, it had been booked for ages and I'd forgotten all about it. She lives like in the middle of the countryside. And she'd like text me being like, really excited about you coming. I've got all the food in. I was like, oh, I'm going to have to go. Like, I couldn't cancel. I'd forgotten that I was supposed to be doing that. She was pregnant, um, like eight months pregnant. So it was like, I couldn't postpone it. I was seeing her before the baby came and it was actually the best thing ever because I literally had no signal. We did sort of bits of radio, bits of, um, you know, whatever the next day and all the promoting it. And then like, I couldn't use my phone even if I wanted to, because I was in this cottage in the middle of nowhere. And we just went for nice walks with her dog and cooked food and had a really lovely chilled weekend. And I hadn't planned it that way, but that was really helpful. And I guess, yeah, it's just finding what works for you. But I'll maybe think about that next time because that worked really well for me. You do, you do. I did sort of a formal journalism masters and I learned stuff there, but it's things that you pick up, um, you pick it up a lot more on the job and a lot of it is reading people. It's something you can't be taught. It's like reading people and learning what might work and whether you should go in softly, softly, or whether you should be more confrontational, or whether they're gonna slam the door in your face and you get one question and you've got to ask it really quickly. Um, we did have a chat about what we needed to ask him. You know, we, we discussed that at length beforehand about, you know, um, I mean, the main thing, we didn't think we would get 40 minutes with him. We never did. We thought we were going to get one question and that would have to be, did you murder Agnes Wanjiru? Um, but we'd had a bit of a chat about, well, it was helpful in that we'd written everything down. So we kind of, it almost helped that we had to go back because then we sort of were able to run through all of the allegations and we talked about everything that was in the story. But yeah, I think it just comes from doing it more and more and working out what's going to work with people. Um, and it really helped to have, so we both did that one together and it really helped to sort of ask follow-up questions and bounce things off each other. So I, that's rare. I don't think I've ever or very rarely done a door knock with two journalists there at the same time. Um, but yeah, we were quite lucky with that. Absolutely, yeah. And I think um, that guy, the first guy that I spoke to, he said it, he said, you know, they, they see women, like African women, as like, you know, they, they probably wouldn't do it to a white woman at home, but they, you know, they, the value they place on that life and they don't see them as like equal to them. So yeah, absolutely. And I think not just that, I think, yeah, the army would have taken it more seriously potentially, but also like the media at the time as well. Like, you know, all the headlines were sort of, prostitute and all of this so I think you know that and politicians and now you know politicians have been great in Kenya and in the UK there's been a lot of push from parliament and there's you know MPs who are saying to us you know we really want to move this forward um but you know I think that took like seeing the the human face behind it and you know getting those pictures from her family and um but yeah I think that definitely affected how it was dealt with up to now I don't, I don't. Um, I suspect it was like there wasn't that much interest in it because it was, you know, reported as a Kenyan prostitute and uh, like that was literally the headline um, of a lot of the stories. Um, yeah, I, 
yeah, I don't, I don't know, but I'd guess, I guess that that was part of it. And yeah, resources as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it took a lot of work. It took two of us months of work, um, and you know, other people on the team, freelancers, journalists in Kenya, and I, I guess people just didn't want to put that much. You know, if it had happened in the UK, maybe they would, but they didn't want to put that much time or effort into it at the time but it just shows that things are worth digging into if you think there's something there. Yeah I think so and like you know the fact that that was several years later that they were joking on Facebook and things like that so yeah, maybe it would have been more difficult to get people to talk at the time, and they all would have been still serving at the time. That regiment, they were off on tours to Iraq, to Afghanistan, so maybe it did make it a bit easier to go back to it some years later. Yeah, you try and... You, you try and sort of ask sort of open-ended questions. You wouldn't want to try and put words in someone's mouth. Um, so yeah, and it's just more, yeah, it's, you, don't, you just don't want anything that's potentially going to come back into a complaint or that someone said, you know, they were led into it or anything like that. So yeah, you have to be, I mean, it's kind of, you're having to think a lot and you're like, you know, when you listen back, you sometimes think like, oh, maybe I should have asked that slightly differently, but you can always, as long as you get like the main, <laughs> the most important ones, if you think about how you're going to ask them, you, yeah. Um, but yeah, you do, you do have to think about it, but it's, I, you know, it's not, hopefully no one's going to pick your words apart the way it would if it was like a court case. So you maybe have a little bit more leeway than a lawyer. Brilliant. I'll leave it there then because we're already over time. Thank you.